afternoon. Thank you all very much for coming to uh, um, our, our first highly publicized uh, uh, talk this summer at uh, the eighth summer of, uh, of YAI. Um, I'm here to introduce my good friend Victor Wong, who is uh, the CEO and, and one of the co-founders of Paper G, which actually uh, predates YAI. They were actually founded before YAI even came into existence, but then we just happened to to, to sort of fall in together in the early days of both our organization and his organization, and we were set up on, on um, uh, above Ashley's ice cream. Actually, no, he started on Chapel Street. 1140 Chapel Street was where they were set up. Not, not far from, where were you? You were above the? Uh, we were right above Book Trader. It used to be the old, I think, Secret Service like office or something. For the above Book Trader, and then they moved over to uh, 282, 282 York Street before heading out to greener pastures in, uh, in California. Um, Victor is probably, oh, in addition to being one of the earliest fellows, is probably the most successful running entrepreneur with the biggest run rate right now of any of the ventures out there in the, in the working world. Some other people decided to sell their businesses before they got to the scale of his. This guy's decided to, to stay with the business for the, for the longer haul, it seems, at least for now, and try and grow the team from from the stupendous size it already is to something even larger. Um, he has been quoted uh, by the New York Times as being the man who could to develop an ad engine to put madmen out of business. Um, he has over 100 media companies as customers and 10,000 advertisers. Uh, these include Hearst, Time Warner Cable, Charter Communications. Um, he's a noted author now, has written for a number of columns, um, graduated in 2008 or 10? Uh, uh, originally 09, dropped out. Okay, so he was going to be an 09. He did come back. He did come back and he did finish two years later. So uh, kudos to him. And uh, w one of the most important fellows we have, especially on the West Coast, we were, Yale was actually the, um, the um, beneficiary of a massive effort that Victor put on just a few weeks ago. He hosted a conference of West Coast um, entrepreneurs and investors in the Bay Area. And... Um, 200 people came because that was the limit of what the, of what the facility could hold, but there were a great many other people who were told they couldn't come in, they were on a wait list, and they were you know, outside bashing on the door, but they couldn't get in because of, I guess, a fire code or something. So, so Victor's turned in to be a, a pretty important guy in terms of bringing the whole Yale entrepreneurial ecosystem into sharper focus. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Victor to, to talk to us today, thanks. Great. Um, just want to make sure this is on. Um, so just to give a little more context about what we do before I kind of dive a little bit into startups and just some advice and some thoughts um, that I prepared. Um, I started the company with three other co-founders uh, while students here at Yale. We basically wanted to simplify the process of bringing print advertisers and publishers to digital, which might not sound too revolutionary now, uh, but at the time, uh, print was the dominant force in publishing and advertising, um, and digital was certainly on the rise, but hadn't yet taken off yet in any significant way in terms of material revenue. Um, so we started a company with that in mind. We built a technology which is able to uh, automatically design ads and optimize ads. Um, so we really built an algorithm to, to really figure out what is good design and how to apply that to advertising. Um, so we had a pretty nice quote on the New York Times uh, regarding that effort. Uh, but you know, the journey of a startup is, is quite long, uh, as you'll find out as you guys continue to pursue your ventures. Uh, we got written up in the New York Times, I think, back in 2010 um, or 11. Um, and at the time, the team was pretty small. It was about mm, five to 10 people, maybe. Uh, company now is about 60 people, uh, headquartered in San Francisco, with offices now in uh, Seattle and Vancouver. Uh, so we are all West Coasters now. Uh, but today, the company is uh, got the profitability uh, last year. Uh, we did all of this while raising pretty minimal venture capital. Uh, I think to date we've raised uh, a little over $2 million uh, from seed stage investors, angel investors, um, and we're able to really make that work. And we did this uh, back during the height of the financial crisis, which uh, for some of the undergraduates, they probably were still in high school uh, when that was unfolding. So uh, we basically were able to make a lot of work with very little. Uh, which is a very useful lesson, I think, obviously, as entrepreneurs. Um, so that's just a quick background. And uh, I, I wanted to do something a little bit different from some of the other talks I've given uh, at some points uh, for YEI. And I wanted to kind of step back and, and kind of talk about 
startups, I guess, uh, from a bigger framework um, than, than just our specific experiences, though I certainly will draw on some examples that we ran into and, and, and encountered. Uh, but because this is Yale and because everyone here, I guess, comes from a liberal arts kind of background, uh, I wanted to kind of examine the startup experience uh, from that lens uh, and just kind of dive a little bit deeper in some questions that I, I, I constantly find myself talking about and thinking about. Uh, and it's kind of funny because uh, I guess liberal arts, as I'm as explained to me, uh, actually is the definition of, um, if you look back, is kind of the, the subject matter required in order to be considered a free person uh, way back, you know, kind of during the Roman times. Um, and so perhaps if I take a little spin on that, uh, I would consider the liberal arts education for startups is like the minimum you need to free yourself of the system and start your own company. Um, so with that, uh, just a starting point when you think about companies, like what is the point of a startup? What is the reason uh, why you're doing a company? And I think it's kind of an interesting question. Um, and where do companies come from? Um, there's always a creation myth uh, for every company. Uh, so for example, um, you know, everyone talks about how Google was started out of a I think out of a garage, um, you know, with two guys just hacking it away on software. Uh, when the truth really was, they actually came up with the idea like a year or two earlier, uh, worked on it for a while, ended up raising a million dollars in seed money from Sequoia Capital and Kleiner Perkins, and then moved into a garage because they wanted to replicate the story of, I think, Hewlett Packard, which started in a garage, right? So. <laughs> everyone, like, here's all these great stories. Like, I'm sure everyone here has seen the, the movie The Social Network. You know, there is a kernel of truth to all that based on some accounts of the story. But ultimately, a creation myth is born uh, around an idea. And that, you know, this is similar for any culture, and everyone has beliefs. And the reason why this exists with startups is very simply that um, ultimately you need a very simple way to convey your story, right? You need to explain why do you exist. Um, how did all this come into being? And so oftentimes, the reality of how companies come together is not actually reflected in the stories that you might hear about or read about about startups. Um, so you know, for our company, we actually, um, in many ways, have evolved as a company. Um, and our creation story certainly has evolved over time. Um, and this is true for every company. Um, so when you think about your, your, your company and you compare it to you know, these great stories of how you know, one moment, you know, this great idea came to you because, like, I mean, Drew Houston from Dropbox says, like, he was on a bus and he realized he wanted to file sync his, share, his files. I've heard him give this story, like, several times, but that's not really the story. Like, it's, you know, but it's a great way to explain what you do and what the problem is. Um, and so I, I wouldn't want you to mistake the creation myth for the true work going into the creation and the time it takes, really, to build a company. Um, the creation myths are really a byproduct of many generations, I guess, going after the initial creation uh, as a simple way of conveying what's going on. Um, so that's, that's one kind of construct I wanted to, to talk about um, like from the, I guess, liberal arts perspective. Um, another one is really, you know, what is the point of existing? Why, is, why are we here? Why are we doing this? I think it's a very important <laughs> question to ask as a, as a company, not certainly as an individual, you should figure that out. Uh, as a, <laughs> but, I think as a company, you should figure this out, and as founders, because it's something that you will grapple with over time, surprisingly, a lot, because you'll get to decisions where, like, do we sell the company now? Um, and there's been a number of YEI fellows who've gone through this decision-making tree, and we've gone through this several times. Um, you know, so are you motivated by the money? Are you motivated by building a really big company, any company? Um, are you motivated by seeing this particular idea come to fruition? Um, and this, this, surprisingly, the motivations ultimately dictate a lot of the actions. Um, and so having clarity on that from the beginning, I think, really aligns you with your founders. And so when you get to those tough decisions, it's not like a hard conversation where you realize that everyone was doing it for different reasons. And in fact, that uh, you know, you're not going to get the outcome that you wanted because everyone's going to go their own ways. Uh, so I think you really do have to ask yourself uh, in the beginning and throughout, like, what is it about this that you're doing? Because if you really want to see an idea through, pivoting may not be the right idea because you know, if you really care about a specific idea taking hold in the world, why are you pivoting? Like, that's not going to get you closer to your goal. Uh, but if your goal is to ultimately find a successful business idea or business model, then pivoting could be a very good tactic um, and a successful tactic. Um, 
But these are all comes down to those motivations. And so I think a lot of people don't spend time, really just like individually, you don't think necessarily spend as much time in undergrad thinking about these things. Um, and so as a company, it's not surprising that a lot of companies don't think about why they're starting the company. And as a result, they run into many years of like, well, what are we doing? How are we going to do this? Like, how much longer are we going to work on this? Um, what should we do in this situation? So I think getting to the, really the core of that is, is very important um, for everyone. Um, Another thing actually I think about a lot um, is uh, this kind of this notion of the social contract. Like, what is it? Why when you why do people join companies first of all, right? Um, why do you as an employee join a company? Why do you start a company? Um, what is your obligation as a company to your employees and vice versa? And this is just like you know, if anyone that takes social theory or um, social sci sciences, thinking about like. What is the original social contract? Why do people join societies? Like, what do you benefit by being in a society versus being an individual? And I think the answer generally for that is you obviously get stability, you're getting shelter, order, um, better chance of survival. Um, and so as individuals, like, not even talking about startups, but joining a company potentially as an employee, you know, that's probably what you're looking for too in many ways. You're looking for stable income, you're looking for career track, you're looking for an opportunity to learn something um, and ultimately you know, advance within an organization probably. And so under thinking about your company from a societal standpoint, I think is a very interesting uh, way to look at it because it starts getting to the heart of you know, what are your values. Um, so for example, thinking about why would a person join your company versus joining Google or Goldman Sachs? Is it that they're motivated by money? Is that what they want from a company? Um, is it that they want to learn a lot um, and become an entrepreneur themselves, or um, simply just gain a, a lot of skills or exposures to different things? Um, and so understanding what that exchange of values is for when they sign up your to your company is very important, because that will help you recruit people and motivate people. Um, but it also, you start thinking about, what is your obligation as a founder to your, to your company? Uh, we have 60 employees. Uh, we have a, actually a remarkably low turnover rate in terms of uh, voluntary turnover, meaning number of people that have left our company uh, because they've chosen to. Uh, I think the number is something like two or three people, maybe four, like definitely less than a handful of people have ever left Paper G uh, because they've decided that they wanted to go do something else. Um, meanwhile, you know, we've certainly terminated folks um, over the course of the, t of the company uh, for bad performance, cultural fits, um, and you know legality issues, perhaps. Um, so there, there's a lot of reasons why, but you have to then ask yourself, like, well, if you expect your employees to give you two weeks' notice if they're going to leave for another opportunity, what is your obligation as an employer to the employee? Should you give them two weeks' severance? Is that fair? Are you obligated to give them four weeks' severance? Doesn't that seem unfair to the company that you have to give more than the employee has to give to you? Are you okay with that? Do you want a social safety net for your employees? How are you going to convey that to your employees? And so like, in many ways, the, the beliefs of the founders very much shape the company and the culture that it builds, um, and ultimately the, the people it keeps, because it will attract the people that share the same values, and ultimately will push away people that don't embrace those values, or will demoralize the people that don't have the same values. Um, and so if you do not have a strong understanding of what you believe in and what you value, you're going to either make, at worst, inconsistent decisions, because as founders, you can't agree on what to do in a situation, and so every time it's different. Or, and so people actually start questioning if there's any stability in the company or whether or not they can trust that the system is fair. Um, or at worst, you, know, you really basically make decisions that create a very, um, very conflicting and harsh environment that people don't want to work in uh, because they find your values off-putting, um, and it's not a place that they want to park their career in. So, Thinking about what is the social contract that you're offering your employees is something I think most people don't think about. Obviously, when you first start your company, you're much more focused on what are we working on and like how are the founders going to work. But it starts very quickly becoming an, a, a contract among the founders, a contract with the, the investors, and a contract uh, with your employees, whether it's a written contract or not. Uh, at the end of the day, you are making a, an agreement. Um, and not having firm values thought out can very much cost you down the road. And I've seen this countless times uh, with other companies. Um, and with our companies, there's certainly been times where we've been challenged 
but we have been fortunate that the founders share the same values and so have been able to make consistent decisions about what to do in what situations. And over time, as a result, that has built the narrative and the history within the company of what we would do. And so employees can find consistency and stability uh, by working with us rather than working at a company where you know, it's whatever the founder says goes uh, because he's either upset that day or not. Uh, so some things to start thinking about even this early into the company's life um, is this kind of contract that you're gonna, you're gonna provide people. Um, you have to think about anytime you're forming a society, right? you have to think about ownership and governance. How are you guys gonna resolve decisions? What's the fair mechanism of doing so? Um, so founder equity splits are, are a very common issue that everyone here will probably face if they haven't started their company yet um, or will fight over even after you had agreed to it um, years later. Um, very few companies, I think, get it right, exactly right the first time. Um, and that's because you really don't know among the founders who is that committed. And that's because you might feel committed now, but a year from now of, uh, of grueling work at a startup, you might realize this is not for you, right? And so you might decide to walk off. Um, and so is it fair that you, know, you have this much equity? Probably not. Um, so you never really know until after the fact whether or not you guys got it right or wrong and, or by how much. Um, and there's mechanisms to balance that, and I'm sure YI will cover that for you. Uh, but just thinking about fundamentally what you guys think is, what is fair? Like what's, you know, as a society, like is a, everyone gets paid equally model, the model that you wanna have in your company? Is it the person that's contributing the most gets the most? Um, how would you determine that, right? Um, how are you gonna determine that from the initial beginning without all the perfect information of knowing how people are gonna work together? Um, so you very much actually have to think about this from a societal value standpoint. What do you believe in? What do you think, what is the world that you wanna create? Because that's the world that you're gonna be living in every day. Uh, so thinking about the society that you're putting together and the mechanisms for resolution differences, is it gonna just be you have to work it out with you know, whoever it is, is the founder, the ultimate arbiter? Um, is there a policy that you guys are going to eventually have to put in place? As you evolve as a company, you, you'll probably go through a natural evolution of like, well, we'll decide that as we come by the founder, but as you hire more and more people, that's just not possible. You have to start putting institutions in place. You have to start thinking about, oh, well, I, don't, I can't be involved in every decision, so how am I going to build a framework for others to do it? How are they going to understand that? So think about your startup as the company or as the, as the society that you want to build and live in. Um, because that's the reality that you're going to be occupying for day in and day out uh, more than anything else. And everyone's going to model in your company their behavior after how you conduct yourself and how you want the company to be. Um, so as founders, you basically have uh, the power to, to shape that very early on. And if you don't get it right very early on, it starts becoming much more difficult later on to change. Um, and it generally involves removing a lot of people in order to change it. Because in the end of the day, uh, you know, rules and such, even if they're codified and written down, don't really matter. It's basically whether or not the people want to follow it. Um, and so I think it's important to figure out those values and attract people with the same values. Otherwise, you're just going to be spending a lot of your time fixing problems that you wish uh, that you probably could have avoided. Uh, another thing that I think, uh, you know, in the liberal arts tradition that you kind of grapple with a lot of times is, is ethics. And I actually think this is the most interesting reason why. Uh, I at least find uh, startups and business in general uh, fascinating um, and why there's never a boring day really working at a startup. Um, and that's basically you deal with constantly challenges between the individual you know, good and the collective good. And I'm talking about situations, um, plenty of situations that we've run into like um, if, you know, do you, um, do you, lay, do you choose to lay off a bunch, a lot of people um, who are non-performers um, or terminate them, let's say? Um, or is it better to lower everyone's salary in order to make the next payroll, right? Which one is better? Is it fair to punish the ones who work really hard? Um, or, but at the same time, perhaps keep everyone and, and perhaps uh, keep the team unity? Or is it better to cut the people who aren't contributing as much, right? Uh, that's a challenge that a lot of companies face, uh, and you'll no doubt only face at some point. Um, you'll start thinking about issues like, um, 
if someone is individually productive, but let's say he's not a cultural fit because for whatever reason, you know, he has a different work ethic, he doesn't share the same values, he just doesn't get along with other, one, other people, do you fire that person, right? He is making other people upset. He is making other people unproductive. Um, so is that fair to him to fire him even though he's doing his job very well? It's, uh, it's a classic issue, especially in a case of a startup where you are reliant on very technical talent um, or not necessarily technical, but very particular talent that's in short supply and that person has more leeway perhaps to be difficult because they're not as replaceable. Um, so how do you handle that situation? Um, uh, another situation that startups run into very typically and why they get a lot of flack, I think, for um, the current gender imbalance in startups is oftentimes um, after you get to a certain stage as a startup, you know, you want to hire people. Um, so you can't just hire among your friends. In, your, in this demographic, I'm making the assumption most people here are early 20s, mid 20s. Um, and so you run into start, you start trying to hire more experienced people, which means they're going to be older. Um, and so you start running into things like, oh, well, I have X dollars in the bank. Um, so this hire has to be like the right hire. Otherwise, like I just wasted all this money. I won't have any more money to, to fix this, this mistake if I make a bad hire mistake. Oh, this person also, let's say, is recently married, is female, maybe is thinking about having a kid. What happens if she has a kid and wants to take time off for uh, maternity leave, right? What, how do you handle that? What's fair to who? Uh, if she takes three months off, right, paid or unpaid even, um, that could be disastrous for a startup because they no longer have the resources to execute against the plan that they set out to do. So do you let that factor into your decision making? A lot of companies do, and I don't think it's right, but it's illegal in fact, uh, but that's, <laughs> it's a reality. Um, it's a reality that you'll start facing. Um, you know, there are rules that you guys are probably unaware of because you're too young that particularly protect older, em older employees uh, as regards to termination and severance and all these other factors, like issues that don't have anything to do with your product, you probably aren't even thinking about now. Uh, but you'll start realizing, oh, well, if I hire an older person, it's going to cost me more money. A younger person costs less. They probably have more hours available because they don't have a family to take care of. And you know, if I need to terminate them, it's not going to be much of a hassle. Is that the sort of company that you want to work at? That's the company that you're creating if you, in fact, are creating that policy. But you're not probably not thinking about it explicitly, um, at least initially. But I can tell you that there are conversations that happen all the time in Silicon Valley where um, decisions are made probably on, on a on a very shaky legal basis, uh, but certainly on the basis that the company needs to survive, they cannot take a chance, right? This is a lot of times why uh, people will say VCs are more likely to fund men than women um, in many ways, is among many other bias, among many other reasons that they might not. Um, but these are fundamental questions of what you believe and what world you're gonna create. Um, because it's very easy to say, oh, this company, is, has bad ethics and bad values, but when you're in charge, you really can't blame anyone else. It's your decision. Um, and so if that's the world that you want to live in, that's the world that, uh, that you can make. Um, so fundamentally, like every day as the founders, you'll be put in the position of a decision maker where you will have to make a trade-off. Um, you'll have to decide how does that decision impact downstream uh, for your company and, and the whole world, if you want to, if you think that you have that much of an impact, but you have to think about that constantly as founders. Uh, another very common example of, of challenges, at least that we've we've run into, certainly as a I think B two B business, and I think probably lesser extent to B two C companies, but uh, uh, and this is a situation recently highlighted by Elon Musk, where uh, his company, if you guys aren't familiar, he started Tesla, PayPal, SpaceX, all these big companies. And most recently at SpaceX, he alleges that he got passed over for a billion dollar contract with the Air Force because the Air Force official who was in charge of the procurement process wanted a job at SpaceX and he said no. But the competition who was bidding for it 
gave the job to the official. So right after the contract was awarded, the government official moved over to that competing bid, right? Doesn't sound particularly um, ethical, uh, questionably in terms of legality because it's a public official, um, but it's something that we actually see all the time in the private sector. Uh, we Paper G, there's been at least two incidences where I can think of where VP at very large tech companies have offered to do a deal with us, but we'd have to hire, they've insinuated we've had to hire them uh, afterwards because they gave, gave us that deal, right? So you have to ask yourself, well, okay, what's actually wrong with that situation, right? Like, if your company needs the money to survive, is that okay? If, this, if your company just would benefit from the deal, do you need to do this? And what's the harm if you do it, right? Like, you can probably rationalize that and say, oh, well, the company needs it without the money, the company won't exist, so therefore, who's, who's thinking about all these silly little ethical things? But the, the next thing that you start realizing is, one, you started to uh, bring in people into your organization who clearly have a high disregard for the interests of the organization that they work for. So is that someone that you wanna work at your company as a VP, right? Like, do you want them to be representing your company? Because they're probably gonna sell you down the road if they just sold the last one. Um, on the other hand, you know, it's a big contract. Like, billion dollars is a lot of money. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't kid yourself into thinking that by going into startup and, you know, you have this ideal version of how business runs that you're gonna be insulated from these problems. In fact, you're actually gonna run into these problems much more than if you worked at a big company. Because if you worked at a big company, you won't necessarily be asked to make a decision on any of these questions. Um, you might see parts and bits of it, uh, but you'll never have to make the final call or decide what's ultimately acceptable. And these were all things that we as a company had faced over the last six years in starting the company, and we've grappled with. And some decisions I think we got right, and some decisions you know, we still question, like, was that um, ultimately the best trade-off in values for everyone involved? So. It's really tough, obviously, to, to get it all right, but I think having that foundation of values is probably the most important. Um, I can think of some, several other scenarios like that I've seen, witnessed either firsthand or through friends have, have seen um, examples like, you know that you're about to run out of money in two weeks, okay, but you need to make a key hire. You think that money is coming in two weeks. Do you tell your key hire that you're about to make, that you're about to run out of money, right? Don't you think it's unfair to hire someone who's gonna quit his job to join your company um, and you're not gonna be able to make payroll in a few weeks or a few months, but you might need this key hire in order to get that money. What do you do? Uh, this is pretty common. Um, or you know, investors are about to make an investment in your company. Someone says they might sue you, but they haven't formally sued you yet. Do you tell the new investors that you might be under a lawsuit soon? But you, if you don't get the money, your company won't exist. Once again, pretty common actually. Uh, you'll be surprised. Uh, these are all things that might sound like will happen to someone else, but I can guarantee you at least one of these problems is gonna happen to you in the next 18 months of starting your company, um, if you are still around in 18 months. <laughs> um, yeah, I talked a little bit about culture. Um, I think a common adage in Silicon Valley that I believe very much is uh, the people that you, that you hire is the company that you build. It's the culture that you ultimately have. Um, so I generally believe that you need to hire people based on cultural fit and alignment. Certainly skill is a big part of it, but I've certainly learned from experience that hiring the right person based on skills solely um, is a very short-sighted and a limited decision. Um, ultimately, people that just don't get along culturally are eventually gonna leave or they're gonna drive other people to leave. And I think that's something to think about, which is you get to decide as a founder who stays and who goes, right? If you keep somebody that's uh, individually productive but is highly toxic or acidic or just like absolutely um, bad for the, for the environment, you will ultimately see people quit, right? And so you've basically made the decision that by keeping this guy, who's an asshole, uh, that this guy, who everyone likes maybe, is gonna leave, because why would you wanna stay and tolerate this work environment? So whether you make the explicit choice or not, you will have decided that who comes and who goes. 
Um, and that's why I think a good reason why we've had such low turnover at our company is that we've been very proactive about uh, ensuring that we keep the people that we want. Um, and as a result, very few people you know, ever, ever think about, uh, I think, leaving our company over a quite ex extended time period. Um, and you know, the last thing before, I, I wanted to kind of keep this brief since I know people probably have questions. Happy to dive into also more anecdotes. But uh, just thinking about success, like what is the meaning of life? What, is, why are you ha what will make you happy, right? What is this all for? How will you know that you're successful? For some people, you know, it, it is like building the company for over 50 years until you, you, know, you die or until you give it to someone else. That's their goal. They want to build a legacy. For other people in the technology space in particular, you know, it's about the quick flip. It's about putting points on the board. It's about winning. Um, and based on the, what you want, that's how you should decide who you work with because if you do not have that same alignment, you know, at least one of you is not going to have success, I can guarantee you, right? Because you guys are going to have very different ideas of where to take the company. So think about that before you start your company. Like, why are you doing this? How will I know that I am successful when I get there? Uh, because if you, don't th if you don't know where you're going, very common adage is any road will take you there. And it's true. Um, you can easily aim. It's true for your career if you decide to go to be an employee. And it's true as a startup founder. Uh, half your conversations post-graduation with friends, uh, if, if you guys choose to be entrepreneurs, uh, will be about them asking, what should I do with my job? I don't know what I want. I don't know where, where to go, right? And if that's, that's bound to happen to you as an entrepreneur if you don't know what you want for your company, from the onset especially. So, um, you know, obviously I'm just raising a lot of questions. I'm not giving you guys many answers. Um, this is the, the nature, I guess, of liberal arts, maybe. Um, happy to obviously opine. Uh, and in fact, I, I, one of my friends from Yale once said, and I, I think it's pretty, pretty um, witty, which is uh, the one thing he learned from his liberal arts education is that not knowing anything about anything hasn't ever stopped him from saying something about everything. <laughs> so I think, it's, and I think it's actually really applies actually to be an entrepreneur is that the truth is you guys probably don't know anything about anything. <laughs> but what liberal arts teach you obviously is you know, the questions to ask so you can learn. And it also teaches you to have an, an opinion even if it's not informed because the worst thing you can ha be as an entrepreneur is being a person without a point of view. Um, I think the Beatles probably called it a nowhere man. You know, Nowhere man has no perspective to not know where he's going. Um, it's, if you do not have a point of view of how the world should be, you are not going to change the world. You're not going to be able to get people to follow you to change the world. So if you are right or wrong, you won't know until after you do it. Um, and you probably don't know everything that you need to know to succeed yet. But you need to have an opinion. Um, without an opinion, you basically are working on nothing. So I think you should definitely think about all those, you know, obviously all the questions I kind of laid out before you start your company, but I think you need to think about what is something that you have an opinion on and then what are you going to do about it? Um, and I think that's kind of the best starting point um, as an entrepreneur. So that's uh, my prepared remarks. Uh, I'm trying to perhaps be more academic since I'm at Yale. Um, but uh, happy to take questions about anything relating to startups um, or about our company or uh, my background. But you'll hear enough about from, I think, future speakers about their companies and their successes. So. I thought it'd be great to kind of lay the groundwork, at least for you guys.